All right, there you go. Welcome to a very special live drive. We have Alex Lyson and Getty Lee here from Rush. Hello. Hello. And uh, I just I, I got an I got an email actually, Getty and Alex, just right before I came up here, and this this is from Al in Chicago. He said every album and tour now feels like an unexpected gift, like icing on what's already the best cake ever. Congratulations on Snakes and Arrows. Cool. So there you go. Very nice. Very cool. I like, I was just looking uh, last night, I was playing this uh, in bed. and uh, <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> That's a shame, yeah. Kind of lonely, it, eh, Kim? What's that, Al? Kind of lonely there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, ever since my career, you know, took a dive and ended up in radio, things are <laughs> kind of lonely. But uh, I was looking on the credits here, Neil Peart on the back here. You, oops, okay. One second. We'll wait for you. Okay. Neil Peart says... Drums and cymbals. That's right. <laughs> it usually says drums, right? Uh huh. So how long has this cymbal thing been going on? <laughs> I think he just had a, a realization that the cymbals are uh, an instrument unto themselves. They are. Yeah. So, do you guys have jams with just cymbals now? <laughs> uh, maybe he does. I don't. <laughs> and, and Alex Bazuki? Yeah, I put a, played a bazooki on this one. Oh, you did? So that's... I thought you guys were actually being funny here. So you actually did play bazooki. Yeah, yeah I, I actually... I was in Greece last summer, and a friend of mine had a bazooki, and uh, started messing around with it and thought it would be great to add it somewhere on the record. You were in Greece? Yes. Cool, man. What I, Were you on an hey, island? In Mykonos. Yeah. Mykonos. Yeah. That's... Uh, what? Is that uh, on the Isle of Rhodes? Uh, it's... No. Uh, no. It's... No, it's, uh, it's, a no it's, it's a separate <laughs> island unto itself, Kim. <laughs> oh, it's a complete, it's a whole it's different close island. close to Greece there. <laughs> well, you think I know because I lived there for a year. I backed up a Greek Tom Jones, so it's kind of oh. cool over there, right? Yeah, Absolutely. it's beautiful. Yeah, it's fantastic. I know, backed them up. So, so anyway, uh, guys, what? how did this thing start out? What, who made the call? When is it? When is the time to... You know, what triggered the Rush album here? Um, well, I guess it had been about a year and a half from uh, the previous tour. So we'd been off for about a year and a half. And I try to push that as long as I possibly can. But uh, The time off. The time off, yeah. And uh, I was starting to feel like it, it, I needed to write some music. And uh, Alex lives very nearby to me. So we decided that we were going to start writing in a kind of a casual way without the whole machinery, you know without the crew and without the clock ticking. So we would get together at my home studio like three times a week and just start jamming mostly on acoustic guitar and bass. And it was kind of a nice, refreshing way to start. And before we knew it, we had about five song sketches, like, you know, songs that were sort of in rough form. And then we sat down with Neil uh, and uh, went over them, and he loved them. And that's when we decided to get all together and and work them all out as a band and that started the whole process is he is he sending you stuff all the time or, or how like you guys just sit down and jam and sing melodies how's that go well you know, we started talking to each other by email and saying look alex and i are going to start writing have you got any lyrics and he said uh yeah sure i'll send you some stuff so he sent a bunch of songs and and we uh pulled them apart as we usually do and you talking about uh, the lyrics lyrics yeah and uh, so we assembled something in, in uh, I guess, about four or five songs, as I said. And uh, that's got the whole ball rolling. And, and so Neil sends you, like, just a ton of stuff. And you, what, what do you do, Alex and Get? You just start picking out, hey, I really like this line. Or, do, or is this stuff complete? Like, this has to come as it is. No, it, just, it really is different every time. Uh, some songs, like on this album, for example, the song We Hold On, that was one of the first songs he wrote and the first songs he sent us. And that barely changed at all. We, we loved the lyric, and we just went with that. Other songs, there may be just two lines that I feel I can you sing properly or I can relate to. Sometimes it's about the material, and sometimes it's about the, the melody, or also sometimes it's about what we've written and how it fits. Uh, and then I'll just go back to him and say, yeah, this part is working great. Uh, this is the kind of music we have for it. What do you think? And he's like so cool to work with. He just goes back and goes, yeah, sure. And he'll rewrite the song around that that part. So uh, it's it's a great uh, collaboration, really. So so do you guys actually edit his lyrics? That's what I'm kind of trying to get at. When do you edit his lyrics? And do you actually write stuff in, or do you say, 
We need a line here, Neil. Um, we're, we, we have first two lines that we're sending you an MP3. What's going on? Well, you know, I kind of act because I have to sing his lyrics and I have yeah. to relate to them and I have to be able to make them my own, which is really important, as you know. Yeah. Uh, so I go back to him and say, look, this is these parts work for me. And I, you know, let him fill in the blanks. And, and that's and he loves that. He loves to know where he stands with his lyrics and he'll come back and he'll he'll write everything around that so uh it's a great partnership really have you ever got an email from him where he's going what the hell are you guys doing i think they all do that <laughs> yeah, i think they all say that. how long did this uh how long did this record feel longer than any other rush records or did it happen pretty quick as far as once you got into the studio this actually felt very quick the um we spent a month with neil after ged and i spent about five or six weeks together we took the summer off last summer and then got into it in September with Nick Raskulinitz, our co-producer. How do you say that again, Raskulinitz? Rask 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 okay, does he have a nickname by now? Bouge. Bouge. Bouge, okay. Yeah. You guys are big oh, on nicknames, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Am I Gumby? I don't know, are you? Yeah, no, I don't. I just heard that around <laughs> the Gumby Rush camp a long time ago. I don't think anyone called you Gumby that uh, I'm aware of. <laughs> that you're aware of, anyway. Because oh, the head and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, no, no. Alex? No, we no. called you much worse things than yeah. Gumby. <laughs> <laughs> but when Nick came up in September and we spent some time together and we got back into writing, we were getting all caught up. Uh, Neil was continuing with his drum arrangements and developing that. So we spent about another two months doing that, uh, September and October. And then in early November, we went to Allaire Studios just outside of Woodstock, New York. We spent five weeks there. The, the intention was to just spend a week getting the drums or a week and a half getting the drum tracks and then coming back to Toronto. But the, the vibe was so great and the energy was so positive that we ended up staying there and doing all the recording. Uh, and then took Christmas off and then went to Los Angeles to mix where Nick and both Neil live. There's a particular studio we wanted to use there. So we spent another five weeks there. So really, the recording process was a total of about 10 or 11 10 weeks. weeks. Yeah, That's it? That's amazing. This is a really complex record. Like As a musician yeah. listening to it, I'm just like, oh, whoa, man, this had to take a long time of writing and putting it together like once you started to rehearse did that take long too or or would you just rehearse it in the studio and start cutting it what? yeah well um once we're writing well alex and i are working on arrangements neil's in the uh in the you know the studio part of the room with his own setup and he's listening to the arrangements and he's learning his parts and he's rehearsing over and over and over and over again so that when we go to cut it his his parts are pretty much formed of course working with Nick's, Nick Raskalinitz doesn't matter how formed your parts are because he's going to make you change them uh, so he was a great uh, and great inspiration and a, and a great producer for us because he was not shy to say hey guys try this or hey guys try that how, so, how did you uh, hook up with him Getty did, did, did he um, contacted you is that the deal yeah he contacted us now he did Foo Fighters and, and Velvet Revolver right right and a whole bunch of other bands and he's he was a musician played I mean he can play drums bass guitar he's been in a lot of bands and and uh, he eventually gave up the band thing and started engineering in LA and he got pretty successful and then he hooked up with Dave Grohl and and the rest is kind of history but um, he let it be known to our management that he was interested to work with us and uh, so this name came in front of us and we were looking at a list of a bunch of people to work with and and we said well let's listen to his uh, reel so he sent us a, a CD of all his stuff and we were just totally impressed with it. it was you know it was really well recorded and something that you don't find on a lot of producer reels the songs were good <laughs> so Obviously, he knows he knew what a good song was, and that that's a significant thing I, for me as looking yeah. for a producer. So that's what you were after. Then uh, I was going to ask you what what the guys in Rush would be after in a producer, because a lot of people don't know what a producer's role is. That's right. And uh, so they might think, what do you need one for? You guys could probably do this yourself. This this many albums in. So specifically, you wanted him his input in songwriting too, or? Yeah. Well, we know we can produce ourselves, but. We really believe that having someone objective who can look at your song structures and, and your performances and, you know, make sure that you are doing your best, we think that's a really big key to making a better record. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, he came along and he, he seemed to be the right fit for us. And uh, he's got such a uh, lovable and enthusiastic personality that he was a very good influence 
to have around the studio. You know, he's just always created a good vibe. We also had, uh, we used Rick, Rich Chicky on a few things. Rich Chicky, Mr. Wasega Beach. Yeah, Rich yeah. is great. He's a fantastic engineer. And that took the pressure off Nick as well. So yeah. Nick could really concentrate more on the music and be more of a producer in that sense. Yeah, and Rich is a producer as well. Yes. So yeah. we, we had the luxury, we called him the dream team, because we had the luxury of two guys that could engineer, and both were excellent engineers, and two guys that were producers. Rich Chicky's amazing. I, I see him up at Tim Hortons in Wasega Beach often, so it's really cool that you guys got him out to, out of there to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, record yeah. a record. <laughs> got him out of the beach for a while. Yeah, speaking of great songs, um, the song that I, ke I keep personally, well, there's lots of them I keep going back here, you guys, um, is Armor and Sword. This, this tune yeah. is blowing me away. Like, huh? Yeah, have you got the record already? Okay. It was out yesterday. Uh, honey, okay, well, sorry. <laughs> Bless Can you tell heart. us a little bit, a little bit about this song? Because um, <laughs> am I hearing a little Tool influence, or are you guys Tool fans? I, I, or well, I'm, I'm a Tool fan, but yeah. I think if you talk to certainly Adam, they'd say that they're huge Rush fans and have been for a yeah. long time. So yeah, yeah, Adam, they're. Uh, <laughs> yep. But this is just a real. Uh, this really sounded harmonically really a lot like chord wise and, and where it was going melodically, guys. It sounded really different than what you guys have been up to. How did the, how did it come about? Did you did you start off with some stuff, Alex or Ged? Did you have this something demoed at home or? Uh, no, the, you know when when Al and I go to, into work, uh, we bring a, a clean slate with us. We we like to start from scratch because we like all our records to sort of be time capsules. You know, they kind of encapsulate who we were as musicians and people at that particular moment. So uh, with that particular song, I think it was, we'd already had about six, seven songs, right, Al? Yep. And uh, Neil put this lyric in front of us that we just fell in love with. Yeah. And I felt really moved by it. And that's an example of one of those songs that changed very little from, from the original version Neil gave us. I mean, it was a few changes, but uh, in particular, the... In particular, the line, uh, no one gets to their heaven without a fight. And that really, I really, I really felt that line. So mm -hmm. we started putting some music directly together to that, and it, and it just worked out. It's a mind-blowing piece of music, and I'm going to take a break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to play that out of the break, okay? So. Thank you. Getty Lee and Alex Lyson here on the Q107. It's got some traffic. Here's Brandon Miles. Classic Rock Q107, sitting here with Getty Lee and Alex Lice in a rush, celebrating the release of their new album, Snakes and Arrows, on Q107. We just heard Armor and Sword. Amazing piece of music, man. I just was like Thank freaking out about, oh, about that one. Um, I was talking to you on the break. Actually, I just want to mention one thing uh, that uh, the guys will sign at the end of this, so don't come up in between breaks. At the end of it, they'll... Uh, We'll be happy to sign, as long as it's not the whole record collection. Just one, one thing, and if you want a picture, right, guys? You'll be Absolutely gracious enough yeah, to do that. No cool. Problem. All right. I just wanted to, uh, we were just, on the break, we were talking about uh, you guys rehearsing. Now, I'm getting together with Max Webster. We're going to do about four or five rehearsals for this gig, and that's about it. But I was talking to you about you guys, your rehearsal schedule. As a matter of fact, Adrian Berkowitz wrote, when you guys rehearse, how long do you actually play on average per day? So... For this tour. Okay. Is that uh, you, Adrian? Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, um, our rehearsals come in three sections. We do about three weeks of rehearsal individually, where I'm at home, he's at home, and Neil is in a, uh, a rehearsal space, and we're playing along to our songs, our finished records, and learning, relearning our parts, and remembering how to do all that, how to sing and play at the same time. So we do about three weeks of that just individually. Then we uh, rehearse as a band in a smaller studio uh, for about four weeks. And we play about, well, we rehearse from about 12 to 5, and it, I guess it entails about three and a half hours of playing every day. Uh, and we do that for four weeks, and then we, we go into a, an arena that we rent somewhere, and we set up the show, and we rehearse the full show for about 10 days to two weeks. And in that situation, we'll just do the full show once a day, and then uh, the guys 
play around with the lights and get all the doodads going, and uh, and that's our thing. And after those ten days, we'll do a full rehearsal day at the venue wherever we're opening the tour the night before. We'll, you know, we'll do the full show, and then then it's opening night. And Adrian, that's why they make the big bucks, man. <laughs> that's some serious rehearsing, man. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot about, of work. Uh, it's about eight, nine weeks of rehearsal. You guys just came, you were just saying today, they, the guys from Rush just came from rehearsal five hours today, right? Yeah. As, right. as a band? Right here. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Now, this, this uh, CD is available on a different, obviously it's available as a CD. There's some new format you guys are trying out? Is this? Sure. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, it's like an, it's a, it's a new uh, enhanced DVD, DVD format uh, in 5.1, and you can uh, provide a lot of other material on it. So it's going to all come as a package with the, with the stereo mix, a 5.1 surround mix, as well as a 45-minute um, a documentary of the making of the, of the film. Okay. Or making yeah. of the album, rather. Wow. And, and isn't, isn't the stereo mix a high-resolution stereo mix, or is that a different thing? Uh, actually, that's a good question. If if it's a full down of the of the five one mix, mm -hmm. when you do a five one mix, you can fold it down into a stereo mix as well, and that would be the high resolution yeah. mix. For those that don't know, five point one is a kind of a surround sound, so it'll be this album but in a surround sound. And yeah. I'll tell you that it sounds amazing in like in your home theater or in your car. A lot of cars now have five one or five or seven one systems. Um, it it just fills the whole room with sound. It's really exciting. So we can picture Alex sitting at home listening to the new Rush album just going, wow, man, am I ever cool? <laughs> yeah, well, he did the mixes, so they're mostly guitar anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did the mixing? <laughs> well, Rich did, but Rich and I worked together. Yeah, Rich, Rich Chicky did the mixing. Okay, that's cool. Um, I want to go to another question. I uh, received like, a ton of questions. That I was asking uh, some of your fans to send in questions. Here's one from Scott Hughes. This was online. When you started out with your first record back in 74, did you ever dream you guys would still be doing this 33 years later? And does it blow your mind seeing an entirely new generation of Rush fans whose parents were kids when you guys started out? How, in other words, how do you explain this new, what, what's happening with new young classic rock fans? Um, it's for, okay. That's, that's a multi-part question. It is okay. I, First of all, no, I, I never expected 33 our career to last 33 years. I mean, I was. <laughs> I wouldn't have given it three months at the time we started. Should have been here. 33 years old. And uh, it is very gratifying to have survived that long and and to have such a fan base and and. It's an amazing thing to look out at our audience and see fans and their kids. And that blows my mind, and I love that. And well, that's something? Yeah, it's really cool. And I, and I can't explain it. <laughs> I, I, that's for someone else to explain, but I, I appreciate it, but I yeah. can't explain it. You can't explain it? I wonder if it's because well, it's, it's a hand me down. You know, I think, yeah. I think, you know, a lot of our fans... For some reason or another, our music means a lot to them. We've either given, given them comfort at some point in their lives, or, or a lot of them are musicians, and it's kind of musicians' music to a certain degree. So I think they've introduced their love for our music to their kids, mm -hmm. and they've come along. And that's why we have a whole line of children's wear. No, I'm just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> So at Rush.com, you can order some of this order stuff. Order your little baby tees. No, no. Uh. <laughs> yeah, no, man. Okay, uh, another question. Oh, let's go to somebody here one more time. Let's see. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, Ken writes, uh, what song from your entire catalog is the most challenging to play musically? What's, what's the toughest one? What's the one that makes you guys keep looking over at each other and going, what? You just play that? Does that ever happen? Well, uh, One Little Victory is yeah. is one of the most difficult songs to play live. Yeah, One, yeah. Little, one little Victory, yeah, that's a tough one. And I would say Natural Science as well. Yeah, natural natural science, science is tough, yeah. yeah. We pull, uh, if we play Natural Science well in a night, it's a real relief. What? If we play it well in a night, it's a real relief. It's is like, that right? Whew, got through it. So why put it in the set, then, if it's like too much of a challenge? Keeps you, you on your toes. Guys, guys get, those get are the to the point songs. where, hey, man, I don't want to really work at this. <laughs> yeah, no, then you get bored and you play crappy. So it's better to have yeah. the tough songs. Yeah, exactly. So you're still touring. Um, what, what's, 
Is there anything that makes you crusty, Getty, about touring? Is there anything that's... I mean, obviously you love touring. It doesn't make me crusty. Uh, Okay. Well, you know, I love to tour, Mm -hmm. and I hate to tour. Uh, It just comes with the territory. You know, I've been doing it a long time, and it's very hard on my my body. Uh, Then after singing a three-hour show... Uh, I'm exhausted the next day. I really am. And, and I work out and I try to stay fit, but it, it's, it's very draining. So as a tour goes on, after four months or five months, you don't really lose that exhaustion, you know. And you know what it's like. And, you know, we do a long show and, uh, and we love to do a long show. It's the best part of the day. Uh, the other thing about touring that's difficult is the physical being shoveled around, you know, being moved from plane to car to plane to car to plane to car. And... Uh, you know, it, your nerves get frayed and you miss home. I miss my kids. I miss my wife. I miss my life. But that's, that comes with the territory. So there's a part of it. You know, when we walk on stage and I see fans smiling at me, I forget all that stuff that makes me crabby. And I just love those three hours I'm on stage. Alex has... Has the satisfaction of playing in front of an audience, has that changed at all over the years, uh, like from when you're a young dude? I mean, you're, you're still a young man, but, uh, you know? Like, uh, you, you know, I don't know. Uh, it, for me, it has. I don't know why that is. I, th- I think I feel more confident about how we play and how we sound, how we present our material, new and old. It's, you, you know, you reach a different stage in your life, and you feel different about a lot of things. and. Mm-hmm. Um, or differently about a lot of things, and and yeah, I think for me it's it seems a lot more satisfying, and I've always enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. But now I can't say that there was one show, for example, on the last tour, where I wasn't excited about the whole night, and there wasn't one moment in in any song that I was bored or didn't feel like playing it. It was really really enjoyable the whole thing. Yeah, I think when you get older, you appreciate your opportunity more. To be honest, mm-hmm. yeah. I remember reading an interview with Carlton Fisk once. And, you know, great baseball player. And and he stuck around quite a long time. Uh, He was in his 40s when he retired. And I remember the last All-Star game he got invited to. And he was just like a kid. And and they said, how how do you explain it? You've been to so many All-Star games. He said, I don't remember the experience of them when I was younger. But I really am aware of my context right now. And I feel very lucky. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned baseball. We've all seen you on TV. <laughs> what? Damn seats. Haven't you? Right? At the games. What got you into that, man? You just, uh... Uh, I got into baseball actually on the road. Like When I was a kid, I used to watch the Tigers and the Yankees. Uh, I think we had the Tigers farm team here in Toronto way back when. But uh, when we were touring, you know what? You remember those days where you wake up at you know, two in the afternoon after getting in at six in the morning and you beg room service to send you up something resembling breakfast and they, <laughs> they send you up like, you know, a BLT or something like that. Right. And uh, so while I was eating it, I'd turn on the TV and there was only soap operas. That was before we had 500 channels. So there's either soap operas or the Cubbies from Wrigley Field. So I started watching the Cubbies all the time and I got totally hooked. Yeah. So you got yourself season tickets. I, I probably received... This week, uh, we've been announcing you coming here. Probably received about 100 emails of people wanting your tickets <laughs> <laughs> while you're on tour. So uh, what, what, where are they going? Were you going away? People, I'm telling you, man, you could make a fortune. I, out I, of this. Got, I, got, I got people covered. I got, I, I, got, <laughs> I got friends and family. This would be a good time to talk. How about uh, a little... <laughs> of... <laughs> Listen, I want to play another song uh, right after the break. I want to play this, um, The Main Monkey Business, which... Is an instrumental. This instrument, you know, like I love YYZ. I love all your smells. I think you've just like completely outdone yourselves here, man. This is like a, a motion picture. Can you tell us how that came about? Was it? Did this start off as something you were looking for as as a tune with lyrics, Alex? Or? No, it was always meant to be a an instrumental. We sort of wrote all the stuff with lyrics that we were going to have, and then you kind of you you sigh a breath of relief. And then you think about the instrumental. That's usually just you know self-indulgence, and you have some fun with it. When we work, when Ged and I write together, Ged does almost all the uh, arranging, and it gives me an opportunity to go back and think about things. And by that I mean I usually have a nap on the couch <laughs> in the back. 
or I sit and I play my guitar and then have a nap. But um, we just we jammed like crazy yeah. over a, a course of time, and then uh, we had all these pieces that get started putting together. And I'll tell you this: this version of the May Monkey business is about a third shorter than the original version, really? which had about eight other parts in it. Uh, and it was just uh, really, really, it totally really insane. It was really crazy. It was really insane. But uh, so uh, it's kind of all about making yourself laugh, though. Part of it, isn't it? Like when you're making music, it's like getting off on yeah. each other and laughing. Oh, man, that's it's cool. Well, man, writing let's do music this. is a great privilege, and to me, it is the best part of the whole thing about anything I do is writing those songs and listening to them back and going, "Yeah, I like that," and I love the idea of. Al and I creating something from nothing. It just blows my mind every time. So that's the most rewarding part of the whole job, I think. All right, well, we're going to take another break. And, uh, right? Yeah, we're going to take another break, and then we're going to listen to that tune. Main okay, Monkey cool. Business right here. If you want to send the personal, get some cute traffic from the M640 Traffic Center. Here's Brent. You're listening to Rush in conversation with Kim Mitchell, live at the Hard Rock Cafe on Classic Rock Q107. All right, we're back with the guys, Getty and Alex. Um, amazing tune there, the main monkey business. Are you going to be doing that this tour? Oh, yeah. We nice, were, we were nice, playing, very we were, good. We were playing it minutes before we came here. Yeah. Is that right? Didn't huh? sound, it didn't sound like that yet. But, <laughs> yeah. No? But it will. The tractor pull factor just... Yeah, it's, you know, rehearsal. The first week of rehearsal, we kind of sound like... Uh, a really bad Rush tribute band. <laughs> and then the second week, we start sounding like a better Rush tribute band. By, week, a, by week nine, we're pretty good. Yeah, no, you, you guys really get, you know, you guys are fantastic every time I see you. you know, it's just Thank amazing. You. And I spend a lot of time on the road with you, and it's just like every night, bang on. You never phone it in, so, so to speak. Thank you. So I want to go to the audience. Uh, is Jim Effer around? Jim? Jim, have you got the microphone? You do? Give Jim the mic. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, sorry. Hi. You Hi. want me to memorize that question? <laughs> you just asked me to write it down. Actually, I think I can remember it. It's uh, about your voice, Getty. Yes. Uh, you've been at it for years, and I was just interested. Do you do anything specific to keep it in shape? Uh, well, I do actually have to uh, be careful, especially when I'm touring and recording. I, I change my diet drastically. I know that sounds funny, but uh, there are certain foods that are... Uh, we're getting a little technical here, medical, but there's certain foods that are highly mucolytic, and that's a gross word, but uh, it means that you know causes mucus, and that's that's the singer's enemy, sort of. So I, I avoid all dairy, uh, spicy foods, and things like that, and I kind of go on a, a bit of a bland diet while I'm touring, and that helps. And and on days off, uh, like on this tour, we're doing a few less shows over the course of a three-week period because uh, I really can't do more than four shows in a week without my voice starting to be uh, really obviously tired. Uh, and uh, on days off, I really have to avoid talking. I know it's hard for me because I'm a blabbermouth. But, it's great. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I try talking less. And uh, what's the other thing? That's about it, I guess. Uh, I try, Actually, touring in the summer is actually very helpful because the humidity... Uh, keeps me from getting colds. The, the 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 hot weather is really better for me. How about Alex? Alex, you you do so you do quite a bit of singing too, right? I mean, backing tracks and stuff like that, backing vocals. Live, I I, I I'm trying to. Yeah, <laughs> more so, especially yeah. with this record. There's a lot of stuff, so mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm really not a singer, but I do enjoy it, and uh, I'll try my best. I promise. I mean, you guys have a good a good ring together, right? Yeah, we have a blast. You have what? We have a blast together. Yeah, cool. All right, I want to go to Adrian Greenaway. Where's Adrian? Adrian, go ahead, man. Hey, guys, thanks for coming out and uh, with your fan base here. Appreciate Thank you. that. Uh, I had a question, and that is um, specifically with computers. What's your reliance on tour with computers and more specifically towards backing tracks and using them for that? Well, we use a lot. We don't use computers live, but we use a lot of uh, electronic gizmos. We have a lot of samplers and sequencers. And we use a lot of bits and pieces from various parts of our album that we kind of cut up into small moments. And uh, we'll assign those. This is, again, very technical in a different way. But 
we assign those to various pedals. And like sometimes if you need to hit that one extra, you know, vocal effect or, or uh, you want a keyboard part to continue to play and, and rather than hire a keyboard player and put them on stage, we'll put it on a long loop. And uh, one of us will trigger it, usually me, will trigger it and we'll play along to that. But, ha but because it's all on foot pedals and triggers, it means that it has to be triggered in time. So it then becomes a kind of a performance-based thing, other th rather than have somebody at the side of the stage just turning computers on for us. We have to do all our triggering ourselves. And sometimes the songs are so complicated that we even have to hire Neil to do some triggers. Like in one of the new songs, he's got a trigger, so he's bragging today about how the fact he's a drummer and a guitar player today. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also part of that question... Uh, a lot of artists now do play to uh, like a, yep. a to like a Pro Tools Absolutely. session with a click track and everything is yep. there, which is not far off of what Millie Vanilli was really doing. And and <laughs> look where they are today. But there are a lot of modern artists that do that, and then they just insert their vocals or they're augmenting uh, guitar tracks and bass tracks and things like that, almost like karaoke in a way. Yeah. It it's very common, and, and yeah. um, the thing that's cool about your music, though, uh, in my opinion as a musician, is you'll have that stuff going, and then you'll break down to three-piece, and you'll just be blasting some guitar solo as a three-piece, like, you know, Tom Sawyer or something. All of a sudden, yeah. Yeah. it's just yeah. fantastic the way you use it. But we don't rely on an external click track or yeah. anything like that. And we we're try to use those everything. things to enhance what we're playing. We, yeah. it doesn't, I mean, we're still playing the fundamental song. And, still being a, a three-piece, but we, we use those just to enhance the sound and to create some more, you know, kind of magic. Yeah. So, so some place in my life, I think I had a dream, Getty, about you standing on a street corner with keyboards and bass <laughs> and everything going. And saying, I used to be in Rush. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, was Here joking, I was joking around the other the day. The little gray-haired yeah. guy standing with a monkey on his shoulder. <laughs> I was saying that we should each get monkeys with tin cups and, and have them, because uh, we're all like one-man band. <laughs> I want to just uh, do another question here from Drew. He emailed me at, uh, on the blog at q107.com, and he said, I recently moved from the U.K. to Barrie. Uh, I've been a big Rush fan for over 25 years now, and the guys are a big part of my life. I was wondering why the band didn't tour the U.K. for so long in the 90s and early 2000s. I saw them in 04 in Manchester, and they were awesome. So you, there's a, quite a bit of time. Are you going back there? Uh, yeah, um, we went back there in 04, but before that it had been about 10 or 12 years since we'd been there. And uh, we were very popular there for quite a while. And, and uh, you know, we just started touring less, and we just found that we couldn't really find the time to hit all the places that people wanted us to come to. So we kind of... We're going through a period where we just kind of regressed and we covered North America, we played Canada and the States, and then we kind of just called it a day. But uh, in the last two tours, we've started to change that attitude. And uh, the tour before last, we went to South America for the first time. And yes. We, found we have yeah. all these fans there. Yeah. That was really an eye opener. And I think that kind of, yeah, it kind of sparked us again. Speaking of Rio, um I know we're, we're concentrating on this album, and I want to play another tune off that and ask you some more about that, but I, I wanted to play you a section of YYZ from, from the Russian reel. Have we got that? Just, just play, play a second of it, and then I want to ask you a question. Can you do it? You know... I played this as a radio announcer a couple months back for our live drive, and when that section hit, I got chills because the audience is singing to an instrumental. Yeah. <laughs> like, does that not freak you out? Yeah. How did that? What happened there? Now you, you tell me the story about this. You didn't get a sound check even for that show. No, that was a, oh, that yeah. was a disastrous. Uh, <laughs> Uh, before show situation because uh, it was raining and we we're playing this uh, this stadium that holds about 60,000 people and there was about 50,000 in it and uh, it was too because of the rain it was too dangerous you know to uncover the gear to do a sound check and it, it just kind of dried up just before we hit the stage uh, 
so we were lucky. But yeah, no sound check, no line check, no checks of any kind. Yeah. I remember going into the truck, the recording truck, oh, no. and it was a bread truck. Yeah. <laughs> and you came in the back, and the equipment was screwed into these wood two by fours that were set up in the truck. I'm not kidding you. It was unbelievable. Yeah. So and was and we managed to pull it off. And if, and it, I mean, it rained on stage while we played. Yeah. But that crowd was was unbelievable because yeah. we started playing that song, and they started singing like we'd been rehearsing with them for weeks. You know, I was like, they wrote their own parts. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> How did, they, how did they do that? I figure it must have been some sort of uh, soccer chant or something that they just kind of fell it's, into. Or well, it's the melody of the song. But yeah. it wasn't a soccer chant. It was yeah. YYZ, man. Yeah. That's, that's what gave me chills. It was amazing. Yeah. So, it did, Alex, did you guys look at each other when that started to happen and go... Oh, it was intense. The whole crowd was, was bouncing yeah. up and down through the whole song, and you, which you see yeah. on the DVD. But, yeah, it was incredible. They were an amazing audience. In fact, when we mixed that, uh, we listened for about an hour without the band. Just listened to the audience. And it was incredible to listen to. Just really wild. Man, I see you mentioned a DVD. Are you guys going to do any filming for this uh, concert tour coming up? Well, at the beginning of every tour, we say, well, I don't know if we need to do another one. We just did one, but then we always do one. So, <laughs> probably. I would say Probably. We have a question from uh, Dawn here. She's called Dawn Chicks Dig Rush. No kidding. So ask Kitty and Alex if they'll come down to the docks and play Battle Scar with you and the guys in Max. Yeah. Right <laughs> you knew I was going to put you on the spot, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, wait a second. We're still waiting to get paid for the first time. Oh, okay. <laughs> go on, hey, go good on. response. I like that. Hey, good. I like that. Is that because I, I we Max stood you up at a dinner? Like exactly. 13, like, exactly. Uh, see. That's we what happened. We haven't gotten over it. Thirteen years ago, we were supposed to hook up for a dinner, and and we stood up the band. Yeah. Max. Can you imagine? Yeah. We they were, were probably going to pay too. In so. tears. So I want to ask you about your. Of course Ask you about your family, man. What's going on? You have. Uh, my you're, family is You're a great awesome. father. I mean, you're a great musician, but also uh, getting well, into great... thank you. I hope my kids think that. But uh, I have a son who's uh, going to be 27, and he's uh, getting married in a couple of months. So I'm very happy about that. And I have a lovely 12-year-old daughter who's uh, just thriving and loving living in Toronto, and she's quite a treat. And my wife is doing great, so we're in, we're in good shape. Yeah. She's still in the clothes, but she had a clothes thing. No, when, when my daughter was born, she got out of that business. Okay. Yeah. Because she made some clothes on some of my album covers, uh, Mutiny Up My Sleeve. That's she, right, yeah, your, yeah. your wife, Nancy, yeah, she made she, that she, stuff she, for me. Her and her partner were very talented. Yeah. I, get, I get busted for that all the time. Like, <laughs> Who made that? His wife. <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> Alex. Well, I've got a son who's um, 36. I, uh, I was eight when he was born. <laughs> um, just like a rock. Yeah. My wife and I both missed the same health class in grade 10. So, and, and I have a 30-year-old as well. And I have a three-and-a-half-year-old grandson and another one on, it, on, on his way in July. Yeah, man. And I got to say, I love it. It's like a second chance to be there when they're young like that. Pull up the picture. Come on, short. Come on. Uh, come on. Come on. You were showing me. Come on. Look at it. Sweet kid. Look at it. Look, there's his grandson. <laughs> That's a grandson too. Oh, Guys, thanks a lot for coming. I, uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming out. Getty, Alex, thanks, Tim. lots thanks. of luck with this new album. Things are, it's in stores now. All right, thanks a lot, man. Thank you. All the best. Thank you all for coming yeah, out. Yeah, thank you. We'll grab some cute traffic for you. Here's Brandon Miles.